Internet. Today I'm going to give you my list and teach you the top grunge riffs of the 90s. Now coming up with lists like this is always so tough, especially because so many great riffs came out of the grunge scene. And this might be controversial because grunge and similar types of alternative music can often be all about being underground and obscure. But after listening through the discographies of all of the most influential grunge pioneers in preparation for this video, and as I have for years of my life anyways, I personally believe a lot of the greatest riffs came from the most well-known popular songs of this era. And that might just go to show how good these riffs were. So without further ado, let's dive in. Our first iconic 90s grunge riff is Zero by the Smashing Pumpkins, and this song was written by the extremely cool 90s shred master Billy Corgan. There are so many amazing Smashing Pumpkins riffs I could have chosen, but the heaviness and creativeness of this riff made it too good not to include. And this song also features multiple layers of rhythm guitars layered on top of each other, which would probably also explain why it's so heavy. Now this song is actually tuned down to E flat, but I'll be teaching it to you in standard tuning. And if you want to play along to the original recording, learn what I teach to you here in this video and simply tune your guitar down to E flat. The first guitar that comes in in this song, which is panned all the way to the left, plays this. We start with some octaves here on the third fret of the A string and playing that octave of C up here on the fifth fret of the G string. And then you slide down a fret so that your index finger is on the second fret. And then you play it again. And it's important that you mute the D string in between the A string and the G string, because of course, that's not the sound we're going for. And once you do that, this is the fun part. And then you're going to play a harmonic here on the second fret of the low E string, third fret, and then the fourth fret. And in case you don't already know, if you're looking to have harmonics ring out on the guitar, you are just lightly putting your finger on the string without actually really putting pressure. And you want it to be right above uh, typically the fret metal bar here. So. Hopefully it should ring out like that. Try moving your finger around a bit to see if you can find locations where the harmonic resonates more. But then, when you put it all together, this is what you get. Obviously you can hear the rhythm changes the second time you play the riff. end up playing that octave here on the third fret of the A string twice that second time. So there's like a pickup going into that. And something else I wanted to mention, once this first guitar part starts, which like I said is panned to the left, once the drums and the bass come in, you hear another guitar part come in that's panned all the way to the right, and it plays a very similar but slightly different variation of this riff. So what changes here is what's happening on the low E string, where instead of going to the open E, you immediately go to the second fret harmonic, third fret, fourth fret, fifth fret. Versus the first one, which has that open E string. So that was zero. Let's move on to the next one. Up 
Up next, we have a deeper cut off of Nirvana's final album, In Utero. And there are so many incredible riffs from Nirvana's catalog that I could have chosen, but there's something about this riff in Milk It that hits so hard. And before the hardcore grunge fans say anything, yes, it does seem that Kurt may have taken some pretty significant influence from the riff in It's Shoved by the Melvins, which came out two years prior. But the way that the drums and the guitar are so locked in, but simultaneously in total disarray with one another, is kind of magical, to be honest. But of course, we also have to give a shout out to the Melvins, who were a huge influence to Kurt Cobain and were hugely influential in paving the way for grunge to become what it did. All right, let's dive in. And again, yes, this song is tuned down to E flat, as the whole album was, but I'm gonna teach it to you in standard tuning. We're gonna start with a power chord here on the sixth fret of the low E string, three finger power chord. <laughs> and we're gonna play it three times. And then we're gonna jump up a tritone to the seventh fret of the A string. And then we're gonna jump all the way down here to the third fret of the low E string, where you end up playing that third fret twice. And then you kinda just take all of your fingers off the fretboard for a second, but you still strum, so you end up with open E, A, D strings. And then you come back to the third fret, playing three times, move up to the fourth fret two times. So now we have And then you move down to an open E power chord, which you play three times. And I would highly suggest, you know, keeping your fingers in the same shape the whole time. So I'm kind of just moving that whole shape off of the fretboard, even though my first finger is kind of just dangling. So now we have. So the second half of the riff is pretty similar to the first half. So it's kind of like you do the same thing again, but you stop short. So now we put everything together. This is what we have. And there's Milk It. All right, moving on to our third riff. This has to be one of the most iconic and memorable riffs of all of the 90s throughout all rock styles. It's just my opinion. Even Flow by Pearl Jam. And it was written by Stone Gossard, who is a total pioneer of grunge in his own right, being part of multiple majorly influential bands like Pearl Jam, Green River, Mother Love Bone, and the supergroup Temple of the Dog. And the whole track is about 50 cents sharp. So you may have to tune your guitar up a quarter step in order to play along to the original track. But for now, let's just tune our low E string down to D. So it should sound like this. All right, let's get into the riff. So we're gonna start by sliding down from the 12th fret. And that's probably the most fun part of the riff, so enjoy. And then you're gonna slide into the seventh fret of the low E string. And then you're going to play 3rd fret to the 5th fret on the A string. And I do think there's some pretty subtle ghost notes in there. It's not just... It's like... Before you pick any of these frets. It's like a muted... And once you do that... You're going to want to palm mute for sure, playing the open E two times, and then walk down, six, five, three, open. Three times, and then, fifth fret, A string, third fret, and then, six, 
six, five, three on the low E. Open, walk up, three, five, open E. And then, at that point, the intro is kind of over and we start transitioning into the verse. And I wanted to quickly mention what happens at this point. The riff kind of repeats. But now, you can hear it starts with these slides. Uh, it's kind of approximately starting around the third fret, kind of sliding all the way up the E string. Not all the way up, but... <laughs> You end up stopping somewhere around the 8th, 9th, or 10th frets. It's not super exact, but you do it two times in a row. And that's what Stone Gossard's part is doing throughout the verse of the song. And I just wanted to point that out because it's pretty similar to the intro, but a slight variation, and it's pretty cool to play. So now that you know all these parts, and you put it together, this is what you will have. And there you go, there's even flow. Soundgarden is another band with a whole grocery list of fantastic riffs to choose from. But I had to go with the verse riff from Rusty Cage, and I personally don't think I really have to explain why. And I will say the outro riff of this song might even be a little bit cooler, but there is something very satisfying about being able to play this main riff. Let's tune that low E string all the way down to B now. And if you can, run your guitar through a wah pedal, and we're gonna start by playing 10 to 12 on the low E string, and then 12 to 14 on the A string. And as you see here, I'm personally playing, you know, index finger to ring finger, just because I feel like I, a lot of, I have a lot of control with those fingers. But at the end of the day, you do whatever helps you accomplish what you need to do on the guitar. Uh, and yeah, once you do that, you do it twice. And now, you end up playing 10 to 12, and then 12 to 14 on the low E string. And now once you play 10, 12, 12, 14, you play 12, 14 on the A string. And now we have... And then you come down to the 10th fret of the low E string. Could add a little vibrato if you want for a little finesse. And now the timing of this I think just listening to it is probably the best way to get it all together, especially when things get crazy with the drums and the vocals and just, this whole song is kind of crazy with the timing. That's probably the best part. But let me play it slowly for you and then quickly, and then hopefully that will help you internalize what I mean. to hear it once you get it up to speed. The timing can get pretty confusing when you're playing it slowly. So be patient with yourself. Just listen to the song a lot. I think that's usually the best way to actually learn music, of course, by listening as much as you can. And there's Rusty Cage. And final grunge riff is once again not an obscure, super unknown riff. And yes, that was a pun. 
Uh, but this riff is Man in the Box by Alice in Chains, which I think is one of the most important riffs of the 90s. It just wouldn't seem right to not include it on this list. This song was released in 1991, and Man in the Box was the second most played song of the decade on mainstream rock radio, and it is extremely fun to play. And just like a bunch of other songs included in this list, this song is of course tuned down to E flat, and I think it will probably sound the most authentic if you play it down there. It just makes the whole thing sound heavier and the tone will be a little bit more correct. But for now, of course, I'll teach it in standard so you don't have to worry about tuning your guitar differently. So let's start with the rhythm guitar part that comes in right at the top of the song. So first thing you wanna do is play this two note chord where you leave the open E open. And then you play the fifth fret of the A string. And there's going to be a lot of palm muting involved, just so you know. And let's first start with let's first start with getting this rhythm down. That sounds cool, but we're obviously missing some of the details that make this riff amazing. The first being these muted ghost note strums. Basically all you want to do is mute with your fretting hand so that when you strike the strings you get a muted sound, you know, just by laying your hand lightly across the strings, just like so. And there's one more detail we're missing. That extra open low E string. hard to talk and play at the same time. You don't have to worry about that when you're playing, but hopefully that gives a good enough idea of where those accents come in. Let me just play it for you one more time slowly. And then the whole sequence ends with an open E, fifth fret, seventh fret, and then the fifth fret of the A string. And then that whole thing repeats. So now let's move on to the lead part. If you happen to have a wah pedal or better yet, some sort of talk box type effect available to you, then great, because obviously that's part of what makes this riff so iconic. And you know, that kind of tone obviously works very nicely. And so this is all E minor pentatonic. So let's start with the ninth fret of the D string. 7th fret of the G string to the ninth fret. And then you come down to the 7th fret of the G string. And then ninth fret down to the 5th fret. Ending with 7th fret of the G string, 5th fret to that 7th fret on the A string. And there's a little extra note here. Where you play that seventh fret of the A string an extra time. And a few key details to take note of here. Uh, firstly, sometimes when this riff is played at the very end, it does that walk up that the other rhythm part does. And Obviously, that's a great thing to add to the end of the riff to transition into the repeat. Uh, and lots of vibrato for sure. That really is what makes this such a emotive riff too. Definitely want to bend a little bit on that fifth fret of the D string, you know, pulling the string down. And you might want to add some subtle hammer-ons. On one last 
crucial detail I need to add. There's definitely a little bend on that seventh fret of the G string. This adds a little character, just like down here on the fifth fret, the D string. Those are the little details that can just bring so much life and character to the playing. Definitely worth trying out. And there's Man in the Box. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson and have some fun learning these iconic riffs. Again, they weren't all the most obscure underground choices, but I think these riffs were all supremely influential for a reason. And I especially hope that all grunge fans out there enjoyed this lesson, and I hope you have a great day. Bye!